Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me this afternoon. I'm Linda Silverman, and um, I'm happy to share the visual spatial learner uh, concept with you. How many of you have heard this before? Con visual spatial? Oh, that's why you're here. <laughs> How many of you are visual spatial? Oh, you're, you're not sure. Well, we'll look at a uh, slide. <laughs> How many of you are like this lady over here with the file cabinets where everything's neat? How many of you are more like that fellow? Here. <laughs> Definitely a visual spatial crowd here. <laughs> um, I, I don't think of visual spatial learners as being disorganized. I think of them as being differently organized. So if you are a neat Nick, if you're like the very uh, orderly person on the left, and you want to straighten out the materials of someone like that in your life, um, someone you live with or someone you teach with, they will never find what they're looking for again because there are filers and there are pilers. And the people who make piles know what day of the week they put it down there and they know what to, how far down the pile to look. And if you try to organize them the way you are organized, they can't ever find anything again. So the point of the cartoon is really to show that there are different organizational systems. It doesn't mean that the neat woman is the smart one and the disorganized male is not as smart. They're just different ways of being in the world. This gentleman has more potential for creativity so that's not to be looked down upon it's just because the organization system is different. But I am not a real visual spatial learner. You people are the, the real experts, the ones who identify as being visual spatial because you live it and you have it from the inside out. I don't. I am spatially impaired. So my job is just to help people who are like me understand people who are like you. And I, I'll give you a perfect example. I went to the gas station and I was late for work and I went, I mean you can probably tell in the picture that I, I went up to the gas tank and got out of the car and realized that the gas tank was on one side, the gets, uh, pumps were on the other side. So I got back in the car and I drove around. And when I got out of the car, the gas pump was on one side, the gas tank was still on the opposite side. So I got back in the car, I drove around the pump again, and I got out of the car and I still had them in the wrong position. By this time, the guys inside the shop were laughing so hard, I couldn't even get gas, I was too embarrassed. And I ended up going 35 miles on the freeway with an empty gas tank. It's true. So I don't, I don't come to this from internal knowing, but I did notice that a lot of the people who wrote about the visual spatial experience were males who had been um, damaged by the school system, damaged and marginalized and made to feel bad about themselves. And they, they were not fond of teachers. And I was a classroom teacher and I um, am more sequential and so I thought okay, I can be the translator. I can be the medium for the people who can't explain how they think, how they get to their answers. They can't show their work. They just know. 
And they don't know how they know, but they just know. So um, what, when you hear the word visual spatial, just what comes to mind for you? Just shout out something. 3D. 3D. Creative. Creative. I'm repeating because we're filming this and I want everyone to be able to hear it. No concept of time? Yeah, that's true. There's a reason for that. Time is processed in the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere lives in the eternal now. There is no time. So if you have no sense of time, you're hanging out in your right hemisphere, which is what these people do. And if you're very time conscious, you're hanging out in your left hemisphere, and time runs your life. Time dictates how you should spend your life. But there are people who really do not have any time consciousness. What, what else do you think of? Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. I'm so Oh, the helicopter view. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, that's something I don't have. I can't do that. I can't imagine what a building looks like from the top down. Don't, don't have that capacity. How many of you can imagine what's up here or what's over there? And you know you have an internal map, internal sense of direction. I have none whatsoever. I have no idea where I am. I'd have someone take me by the arm to the toilet and get me back, otherwise I'd never be found again. <laughs> yes, so that, it wasn't just that I didn't understand the words, I don't even understand the concept. <laughs> what, what else? Imagination. Oh yes, imagination. What else? Well, I'll share with you what some of the um, teachers that I have worked with uh, have said when I've asked them this question. Artistic, mathematical, bless the computer, great imagination, laughter, needs more time, wonderful synthesizer, I need to see you when you're talking, puts things together without the directions, chess club, can't spell, scattered, doesn't show the work, and illegible handwriting. Does that, yes? Okay. Yes, but I have to, I, I knew you were going to ask that question because I was just thinking about the man who wrote to me on my, I put out a question on my website when I was writing the book, Upside Down Brilliance, about do you relate to these? Can you tell, share your stories? And this man said, I relate to everything except I'm such a good speller. And he misspelled three words in, the, <laughs> in this little two sentences. But I can explain people who really can spell. It's called a photographic mind. So if you can see it and you have that photographic image, you can remember how to spell it. And that is the secret to teaching spelling to visual spatial learners. You have to get them to visualize. Can't visualize, can't spell. Because they can't sound it out. They have to see it. Do you see the words? Yeah. yeah. That's the secret. But I, I did immediately think about this man who said, yeah, but I spell. I really can spell. And he couldn't. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, well, I don't know what it's like in the Netherlands, but in the United States, 
all of our teachers are taught and all of our achievement tests say you have to show the steps that you took to get to your answer. If you can't show your work, you don't know anything. You, you have to demonstrate how you got to the answer. Well, if you didn't take a series of steps to get to an answer, how can you show your work? Your work is, ah, I see it. That's your work. You see it all at once. You just see it in your head. And uh, the people who write the American textbooks, the people who teach the teachers how to teach, and the people who write the achievement tests all believe that everyone takes a series of steps to get to an answer. So you should be able to show your work. That's what that means. So uh, let's see if you're a visual spatial learner. I want you to write down, if you have paper, you know, how many of these fit you. This is a short list, uh, but see if, just make a tally mark. Are you a big picture thinker? Do you solve problems in unusual ways? Do you learn concepts all at once? You get this, aha, I got it. Do you need to see relationships in order to learn? Do you have a vivid imagination? Can you feel what others are feeling? Are you good at reading maps? Do you often lose track of time? Do you struggle with spelling? Are you organizationally impaired? Now, you don't have to fit all of them. But if you fit the majority, you probably are more visual-spatial. How many of you fit half of them? Half fit you. How many more than half fit you? Yeah, we are. You're much more of a visual-spatial audience, so I, this is going to be group therapy, I guess. <laughs> so maybe when the, the videotape is done and it gets posted on YouTube, more people will understand what you already know. So, the, how many of you are teachers? Okay, so how can you tell if your students are visual spatial? I mean, this, this is one of the cartoons. I'm going to show you a series of cartoons from Upside Down Brilliance. Do they know things without being able to explain how or why? How did you get this answer? I don't know. I just know. Do they lose track of time? Do they have difficulty with time tests? Do they remember what they see but forget what they hear? And then, do they have the most creative reason for not having their homework done that you have ever encountered in all your years of teaching. Don't you think they get extra credit for real creative excuses? I think they, I think they should get extra credit. So who, who are these visual spatial learners? They are the children we call twice exceptional. They're gifted with learning disabilities. They're, they're underachievers who aren't exactly doing what we would like them to do. They're your creative learners, your artists, musicians, mathematicians, and builders, and your future surgeons. You really want your surgeon to know where everything is in relation to everything else and put things back exactly where they were. It's a visual art. And in order to get into the field of surgery, you have to take a spatial test to show that this is something you can do. I would not make a good surgeon. You don't want me operating on you. So how many of you believe in learning styles? And um, how do you differentiate for students in your classroom with different learning styles? What, what models or methods or how, what, how do you help kids who learn differently? Yes? Uh, oh, 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. Will you say that again, please? We uh, teach with go goals, and the, the, the pupil, they choose how they will learn for that goal in their own uh, manner and learning style. That's wonderful. Huh. Who, who else? Thank you, Mo. Yes. I differentiate in the instruction methods. Um, some, uh, sometimes I do it verbally, but with other children, I take pens that they see how the, the figures are yeah, visualized. I had trouble hearing that. I, the, the instruction I give in, in different modes, sometimes it's just verbally uh -huh. instruction, and sometimes I use pens to visualize how it's built up. So you're aware that some learn better verbally, some learn better visually. So um, I have heard several times since I got here that a lot of people are using the multiple intelligences model by Howard Gardner. How many of you are, are using Gardner's model? How many of you have been taught Gardner's model? So um, how many intelligences are there? Eight, nine? Ten? <laughs> it's a little confusing, isn't it? It depends. Now, what day is this? Um, the intelligences have evolved and changed over the years. And there's the original seven intelligences in Frames of Mind, which came out in 1983. And that includes linguistic, which is your verbal, musical, logical, mathematical, spatial, bodily kinesthetic, intrapersonal, and interpersonal. And then afterwards, some new intelligences came about. Do you know what the new ones were? Spiritual got axed. Oh, natural. Yeah, it, it sounds like it should be, because, or at least naturalistic, but it's the naturalist doesn't have the same grammar. But um, existential is one that has almost made it, but uh, it's not, we're not quite sure. I'm not sure how he decides when something is in or out, but the last time I heard that was, it was very close to being in. How many of you thought spiritual was one? It was, but it got canned because Gardner said that uh, spirituality is not universal. Okay. So a lot of people think that because I'm um, the visual spatial learner person that it comes out of this model, but actually it doesn't. Uh, the way in which I'm looking at visual spatial is through hemisphericity, not through multiple intelligences. And there is some overlap between Gardner's spatial intelligence and the visual spatial learner, obviously. But you notice that there is one major word missing in Gardner's, and that's the word visual. So, that visual piece is not a uh, part of that model. Uh, there was another multiple intelligences model before Gardner that I'm seeing as a couple nodding heads. How many of you were exposed to Guilford, J.P. Guilford, and his structure of intellect? He had, at one time, 120 intelligences. And then, before he died, he split 
figural into auditory figural and visual figural and ended up with 150 intelligences. I wonder how many Gardner will have. But uh, Guilford's model was all the rage in the United States when I was teaching at the University of Denver. And we had to have all of our students learn the little names, acronyms, that went with each cell. So evaluation of figural units was EFU. And they had to learn this when they were in graduate school in gifted education. They didn't like that much. But it, it has an interesting shape because Guilford was visual spatial. If, how many of you know about Bloom's taxonomy? It's total linear sequential. Compare that to this. You've got a cube, it's got dimensionality. This is a visual spatial thinker. Gardner's model is sequential. So now we're going to change altogether and talk about a whole other realm, which is personality type. How many of you know your personality type on the Myers-Briggs? Or sometimes it's called the MBTI. What, what are you? INFP, that's the gifted type. What are you? Yes. Pardon? INTP, okay. INTPs make great college professors, but they don't ever write tests that anyone understands. They're, they're so intellectual. They're, they're, the concreteness that the students are looking for usually isn't there. But INTP and INFP are two gifted profiles. Who else? Brave. Moat, you had your hand raised. Moat? What are you? I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> I'm a mix and sometimes... I'm a mix and sometimes I'm just like that. Sometimes you're one, sometimes yeah. you're other. Okay, so you're in the middle. <clears throat> um, the introverted, intuitive, feeling, perceiving is the more, most typical gifted child and gifted adult profile. And the extroverted sensing, thinking, judging in the United States is the most typical teacher profile. So there's a real mismatch between the typical student and the typical teacher. The reason this is up here when we're talking about learning styles is that there are a lot of books about using the personality types as a basis for teaching styles and learning styles in the classroom. Have any of you ever seen learning styles based on the Myers-Briggs? There's really good books on this. So if we go by the Myers-Briggs, there is 16, 16 different learning styles based on the 16 different personality types. If we go by Gardner's model, we've got eight and three quarters, maybe nine different learning styles based on the multiple intelligences. If we go by Guilford, we've got 150 different intelligences. And if we have 150 learning styles to go with them, that would be challenging. But this is supposed to be the very best and most comprehensive learning styles inventory that's ever been developed. Are any of you familiar with Dunn and Dunn? Dunn and Dunn's elements of learning style? You are. Have you ever tried it? Have you ever done it in the classroom? You haven't done Dunn and Dunn. Okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is the most comprehensive. There's environmental, emotional, sociological, physical, psychological. And then there are environmental elements, silence versus sound. Are you more comfortable in a silent environment? Bright versus low light, warm versus cool temperatures, formal versus informal design of space. Then there's emotional elements, motivation, persistence, responsibility, structure versus options. 
Then there are sociological elements, thinking and working with peers alone, in pairs, in teams, with adults, and in several ways. And then there are physical elements, perceptual strengths, auditory, visual, tactile, kinesthetic, with or without intake of food or drink. And time of day or night, I, I had to side of just put day or night. Otherwise, if I had to put time in there, I couldn't have done this. Mobility versus passivity. And then there are the psychological elements, global versus analytic, hemispheric preference, and impulsivity versus reflectivity. So if we try to come up with the number of different learning styles that this would generate, we would have eight environmental, eight emotional, six sociological, three perceptual, six other physical, and six psychological elements. How many possible learning styles do you think there might be, according to Dunn and Dunn? That's a very good guess. 41,472. <laughs> I was a classroom teacher, and there are a limited number of hours in the day. And while I respect what all of my colleagues have accomplished in terms of raising awareness about learning style, and I appreciate their work, I have to believe that there is an easier way to prepare for students with different learning styles. So the model I'm sharing with you only has two parts. One that talks to the left hemisphere, one that talks to the right hemisphere. And I'm not planning on adding another hemisphere. So it's not going to grow, it's not going to change, it's going to stay the way it is, and it gets even better. You don't have to worry about the one of them because you already know how to reach auditory sequential learners. Those are the happy campers who come to school, bring you flowers, love your lessons, love the homework, and are doing a great job. They're enjoying school, and it all works for them. So I don't need to give you any advice at all about working with children who are good step-by-step -step learners, who are good listeners, who attend to details. They learn by trial and error. They, you teach in words, they learn in words and ideas. If you ask what the right answer is, they know that there's a right answer that they can get. And they're time conscious, they get their homework in on time, and they're analytical. So instead of our talking about how to create an environment where both types of students are happy, I think we have to be acknowledging of the fact that one group of these students is already happy. And one group of these students is not so happy. They're not as happy coming to school. They're not as engaged. They're sometimes marginalized. They sometimes feel stupid. They are often not picked for the gifted programs. They are the ones who are going to be just below the cutoff score to qualify for provisions. And they're the kids that we're missing. They are the cameramen. They are the photographers. They are the architects. They are the engineers. They are the builders. They are the people who invent paradigm shifts. And they're important. And we have to recognize that they exist and start to make school at least visual spatial friendly. The good news about just thinking about this one group of children is that it's been demonstrated that if you make learning more accessible for visual spatial learners, everybody in the classroom learns better. So the things that you do for this one group also turn on the brain for all of the students. So everybody benefits. The visual spatial learner learns more all at once, whole part learning. They have to see the big picture 
and then they can understand how the parts relate to the whole. They're very keen observers. If you are wearing a colored contact lens, they're the ones that will say, weren't your eyes brown yesterday? If you change a bulletin board, they're the first ones to notice. Big picture thinkers, they get this aha moment. They have strong images, and those who are not good visualizers have strong feelings of knowing. So some of them don't visualize, they just know intuitively or in their gut. They come up with unusual solutions to problems. They lose track of time, and they're intuitive. And these are the kids that I'm hoping that we can pay more attention to. And it, the person who influenced my thinking the most on this population is a brain researcher in the United States named Jerry Levy. Uh, there's a book called Left Brain, Right Brain. I don't know whether any of you have come across it. Well, I see one nod, Springer and Deutsch. They credit Jerry Levy with having discovered the functions of the left hemisphere and the functions of the right hemisphere in her research while she was still a graduate student. And she said that unless the right hemisphere is activated and engaged, this is not just in visual spatial children, this is in every human being, in every learner. Unless the right hemisphere is activated and engaged, attention is low and learning is poor. Because we all have both hemispheres. Even if we bring our left hemisphere to school, our right hemisphere comes with it. And um, if we want a student to be alert and engaged, we have to get that right hemisphere into the act for all of our students. So these are how the two hemispheres work differently. The left hemisphere is sequential, analytic, and temporal, meaning time-bound. Time exists because of the left hemisphere. And the right hemisphere is much more aware of space, spatial relations. It's holistic, and instead of being analytic and breaking things down, it's synthetic and brings things together, sees how the parts can relate to the whole. How many of you have heard that the left hemisphere is also verbal? We're taught that a lot. Um, I don't think that that's accurate, though. And I'm going to give you an example of this. I want you to pretend that I'm your mother. I am old enough to be most of your mothers anyway. And I want you to pretend that you're nine years old. Can you do that? Okay, you're downstairs, I'm upstairs, and this is what you see and hear. Do you hear me? Now, what am I conveying to you? What, what did you get out of my communication? Angry. I'm angry. How do you know I'm angry? Tone of voice. Tone of voice. What else? Volume, what else? Yeah, and my facial expression, my hands on my hips, my body language. Your left hemisphere doesn't process any of that. Only your right hemisphere is aware of all these elements. There's something else that your right hemisphere is aware of. Your right hemisphere remembers what happened to you the last time I looked like that. Your right hemisphere is already figuring out what the consequences are going to be because it sees the big picture of what happened last time, what you're doing now, and the trouble you're going to get into, and what I'm going to do if you don't stop what you're doing that's getting me that angry. So. The right hemisphere has the context. In understanding verbal information, you have to have more than just an ability 
to decode the words. If your left hemisphere was all you had to work with and your right hemisphere wasn't operating, the answer to my question would have been yes. Do you hear me? The left hemisphere is going to say, yes, I hear you because that's all that the left hemisphere got out of what I said. It understood the words, and it can produce words, which are, words are sequential. If I said those same words out of order, I would have a thought disorder, and you wouldn't understand what I'm saying. If you didn't understand the order of the words that I was saying, you couldn't follow my discussion. So. For us to communicate, speech is sequential. Listening is sequential. It's auditory sequential. But it doesn't get at the full meaning. You've got to have more than just an understanding of the words. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Doesn't begin to understand the meaning of what I just said. The meaning came from your right hemisphere, from picking up all the rest of the information and putting it together into a whole. So the left hemisphere is dealing with the text, but the right hemisphere has the context. The whole situation, background, or environment relevant to something happening. So the right hemisphere plays a very powerful role in understanding verbal communication. Nonverbal is a part of verbal communication. It gives you context. The left hemisphere enables you to take things apart and analyze them and compare them and name them, name the parts. But it's the right hemisphere that puts them all together and enables you to enjoy smelling the flower. So there are many, many gifts of our right hemisphere that we do not honor in school. We're not teaching to these gifts. We're not grading children on these gifts. We're not giving them marks, and they're not getting awards and excellence for these gifts. But they're important life gifts. You can't see the beginning from scientific became TIFIC for some reason. But that said, scientific and technical, technological proficiency, holistic and whole part thinking, artistic expression, imagination, invention, discovery. That bottom one, for some reason you can't see the top word, but that's emotional responsiveness. And the D is missing, or yeah, I guess it's black. Hol holographic understanding, intuitive knowledge, and spirituality. These are the gifts of the right hemisphere, and they're pretty important gifts. I want to talk about just one of them. How important is intuition? How important is intuition to you? Has intuition ever saved your life? or save the life of someone you know? Did you say it's pretty important? Do you give marks and in intuition in school? Do you develop children's intuition? You do. Uh, I think it happens automatically, but that's more that the children, just the example that you just gave, with the facial expression and the arms and the thing, I think children learn that really quickly in school. It, they do. It's true. But we have to acknowledge, we have to say it's important. We have to say that your intuition is valuable and good that you've got it and keep working with it and keep counting on it because there is another way of knowing beside your logic. Your intuition has a big picture. It steps outside of time. Think about that. That's how it saves lives, because it knows what's going to happen. Your logic doesn't. Your logic lives in time. 
and it can't know the future. But your intuition can. You have to listen to it. How many of you have had experiences where your intuition told you something and you didn't listen and you regret it? <laughs> because your logical mind says, well, how do you know that? And you can't answer the question, how do you know that? You just know. You don't know how you know, but you're getting a message and the message knows something but you can't explain how it knows what it knows. That is a very powerful part of what you are born with that needs to be honored and developed for your safety, your future, and the future of everyone in your life. So now I'm going to talk about two students. We're going to assume that student A has a certain set of skills that student B doesn't have. And we're going to assume that student B has a certain set of skills that student A doesn't have. So student A has neat handwriting. Student B types 60 words a minute. Student A is good at spelling. Student B is a good visualizer. Student A has instant recall of facts. Student B loves geometry and physics. Student A is well-rounded. Student B is brilliant in one area. Student A is a convergent thinker, knows how to get to the right answer. Student B is creative. Student A is skilled at rote memorization, and student B understands complex concepts. Student A shows steps easily. Student B sees the big picture. Student A is a good analyzer. B, a good synthesizer. A is punctual. B has a more fluid sense of time. A follows directions well. B is an excellent problem solver. Which of these students has a higher grade point average, higher marks? A. And which of these students do you think is more employable in the 21st century? <laughs> B. But we continue our traditions, and we continue to teach what we're commanded to teach in the way we're commanded to teach it, because that's what we're expected to do as teachers. And we, if we want to keep our jobs, we continue to make all of the A group, the important ones, and we don't spend as much time on the B group. Now, I'm, I'm making assumptions here, and please correct me if this doesn't apply to the Netherlands at all. It may only be an American phenomenon, but in American schools, you are rewarded for following directions, turning in assigned work on time, memorization of facts, fast recall, showing the steps of your work, neat legible handwriting, accurate spelling, punctuality, good organization and tidiness. Are those values in a Dutch school? Still, okay. So what jobs in adult life require this set of skills? <laughs> what are we training our kids to be? Yes. Teachers, you got it. <laughs> We're training all of the kids to be teachers. There are other jobs that this will equip them to do. Middle management, good executive secretary, accountant, auditor. I mean, there are some things, some good things. I'm not saying these are bad things. I'm saying they're not enough. How many of you teach gifted children? Are they all going to become teachers or middle managers or accountants or bookkeepers? Probably not. So I've actually inquired at higher level um, technical institutes what they're looking for in a new hiree. What are the skills they want? They're, their new employees to have when they come into their positions. And this is what I've been told. 
if you want a job that's going to pay a considerable amount of money in a leadership position, these are what you're going to have to come into that interview with. The ability to predict trends. The ability to grasp the big picture. The ability to think outside the box. Being a risk taker. Problem finding as well as problem solving so that you find the problems to solve. Combining your strengths with others' strengths to build a strong team. Computer literacy. Dealing with complexity and the ability to read people well. That's helpful if you're in some area where you have to sell your ideas. You have to be able to read your audience. Read the buyer. Are we preparing our students for these higher level positions? Are we giving them this set of skills? We could, if we weren't so worried about the other set of skills, because traditionally, that's what school was about. Yes? Yeah. The mismatch. I'd like you to say that again so they can pick it up on um, the video. It's important. What you just said is important. So it's, uh, it's even worse because most students and pupils already know this is going on. They know that these, this list is becoming more important than... Uh, it becomes more important to, to have de these, um, these qualities and, and uh, the gap between pupils and teachers becomes more and more obvious every day. And then what happens to the student? They lose interest. They lack interest, they, they, they become they disengaged. It. Yeah. Yeah. Just a sec. Thank you. Um, I just don't totally agree with the former sp speaker because I think it's the, the difference, the gap between the system and the wishes of teachers and the wishes of... And I believe of that pupils. that's true. I, I have heard enough stories in the few days I've been here to know that you're, you're caught between the expectations of you as a teacher within the system and the knowledge that your students have that in order for them to get a job, they need something different. I understand that this is not your, your fault. I'm not blaming because I, I was a classroom teacher and I know what that's like. Uh, and I was fired enough times that I know what it's like. So uh, yeah, it, it's not easy. It's not easy being a teacher today caught between these different agendas and expectations, that's hard. So how do you add this to what you're doing so that you can keep your job, but still prepare your students? Yes. Um, I think it's uh, something we have to do because you also see this trend in uh, business. There is still, uh, I was talking to her and I said, what if you uh, will put this on your CV? then uh, you won't get a job. But on the other side, there are businesses um, growing at this moment who just wants to have this on your CV and not the other one. Because uh, we have a lot of them in, in Holland at this yes. moment. And Start they're growing. Up. So we have to change it because the students won't fit into the new jobs. Yeah. So men, much of, thank you, much of what we've been doing has been to prepare students for jobs for a different century, not the century they're in. And yes, you know, you are stuck in, in a teaching position, but if you can begin the dialogue with 
whoever makes the decisions about what gets taught in school, maybe you can begin to change things. Somebody has to start somewhere. We all have to, right? Um, how many of you are familiar with Daniel Pink, A Whole New Mind? Uh, these are some quotes from his book. I never pronounced this word right. Is it seismic or seismic? Seismic? There is a seismic, though as yet undetected, shift now underway in much of the advanced world. We are moving from an economy and a society built on the logical, linear, computer-like capabilities of the information age to an economy and a society built on the inventive, empathic, big picture capabilities of what's rising in its place, the conceptual age. Now, one of the reasons why I think Daniel Pink can be helpful is that he's talking about an economic reality, that the jobs that we're preparing students to hold in the 21st century are all going to be, what is this, outsourced to other countries where they can get the labor cheaper. And if we want the students to have jobs, if we want the Netherlands to be strong economically, we're going to have to teach them to do and to think in ways beyond what can be outsourced. And that, I think, because the school system is an economic endeavor within the general economy of the country, this can begin to reach people, I think. I, I think his words are very powerful. He says, the keys to the kingdom are changing hands. The future belongs to a very different kind of person with a very different kind of mind. Creators and empathizers, pattern recognizers and meaning makers. These people, artists, inventors, designers, storytellers, caregivers, consolers, big picture thinkers, will reap society's richest rewards and share its greatest joys. That richest rewards is the piece that I think they'll understand. What I notice in the United States is that all of the corporations with whom I deal, except the very biggest companies, like Bank of America, um, are becoming more service-oriented. And you go into a hotel, and the answer to any question is yes. Or you go into a restaurant, and the answer is you got it, or perfect. People are being trained to be more aware of service being more responsive to what the public needs, fearful of the ratings that they're going to get on internet if they do a bad job. Don't report us. Don't make us look bad. So there is an economic benefit to the entire country and to the school system within the country to begin to be aware of the shifts in emphasis that are going on internationally. It isn't enough to be a fast calculator. No one is going to wake you at 4 o'clock in the morning and say, what's 4 times 7? I mean, they're just not going to do that. There's a calculator now. And if a calculator can do it, we don't need to spend four years teaching somebody what a calculator can do. Oh my goodness, we have some missing pieces here. So how many of your students do you think are visual spatial? What would you guess based on what we've talked about? What percentage in your classroom? What, just a guess. What do you think? Over 50. Over 50, wow. I never would have guessed that. What, what, but I was wrong, but what, what would you think? Yeah. Pardon? 80%, wow. 
So maybe, maybe you have. I believe, from what I've seen so far, that you might be right. You, I think the Netherlands is more visual than the United States. I do. I think what I've seen, I think you might be right. It, I have data from the United States from our studies, but I never dreamed that there were that many students. So this, we, we invented a visual spatial identifier. <clears throat> and it has a self-report and a, an observer report. And I'm just giving you a few of the sample items. There's, it's not a lot. It was developed for teachers. So we've only got, I think, 14 items altogether. And then we've got a longer one that we're using in a clinical setting. Uh, it's got 36 items, and that's for clinicians. But the teacher version, um, and the student version has things like, I hate speaking in front of a group. I think mainly in pictures instead of words. I know more than others think I know. I have a hard time explaining how I came up with my answers. This one, I am good at spelling as a not. I have a wild imagination. It was easy for me to learn my math facts, not. And what we found with that last one was interesting. We picked up visual spatial girls who never memorized their math facts. It was a more gender fair question. I never would have guessed that that would turn out like that, but we got more girls in our sample with that question. So um, a few of them are reverse, not many. And these, this is what it looks like. And these are the... Um, these are the results of the study. We worked with um, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in city schools and rural schools that were a mix of Caucasian and Hispanic, a very uh, large range of socioeconomic diversity, a lot of uh, lower and lower middle class children in the sample. And about one-third of them came out strongly visual-spatial. Only a quarter of them came out strongly auditory-sequential. And about 45 of them were mixed. So we took a look at the group that was mixed that had a little of each. And we tried to see what, where were their preferences. And in that group, twice as many of them leaned toward visual-spatial. They weren't strong, but that was their preference. They leaned in that direction. Only 15 of them, 15%, leaned toward auditory-sequential. So our research, with 750 fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, white, Hispanic, urban, rural, all socioeconomic ranges, all IQ ranges, uh, we saw that more than 60% in an American school were visual spatial. I'm guessing that it would be higher here, just from the people that I've met. And we found much higher percentages in gifted classrooms, and in Navajo, and in Twice Exceptional. There's a school for, twice, for gifted children with learning disabilities, a high school in California. I think we found 87% of them were visual spatial. So <clears throat> if you had to give a guess about just all of the children in Holland, what percentage of all the children do you think might be visual spatial? All of the students. I mean, there's no way to be wrong here because we don't know what's right. So what, what's just your best guess? What do you think? I want to see how applicable you think this concept might be here. Yes. methods in the Netherlands were, which are based on um, learning on, based on language instead of spatial learning 
while we have so much students who prefer that. Tradition. Is it, is it changed over the years? The, yes, in, it certainly has in the United States. I don't know if it's changed here, but the percentages of visual spatial learners is increasing in the United States. Is it increasing here too, do you think? I think one of the reasons is that we are in an image-oriented world. And that, is be, that iconic world is increasing. Uh, the children are exposed to more visual. They weren't maybe a generation ago. School was much more nonverbal, I mean, more verbal, not much nonverbal. So, yeah, I think the whole society, look at how many children are playing visual games and, and playing with cell phones and playing with iPads. We, we have a very visual oriented society. But our teaching methods haven't become more visual. The children have. So um, we have prized these left hemispheric skills for thousands of years. We, we're using a traditional model that was handed down to us generation after generation after generation. Uh, but the right hemispheric skills of imagery, uh, computer literacy, using your, your mind as a camera, um, this is becoming more important in the 21st century. And for us to help our students become employable, I really think we have to prepare them for the visually oriented creative careers that await them, particularly our gifted kids. <clears throat> and I believe that the visual spatial learners are going to become our next generation of leaders. The ones who were marginalized in school and felt stupid are going to end up being in leadership positions. So this really finishes the first half of this uh, session, not this session, but my presentation. And I'm going to continue in the next session talking about specific strategies. But I, I, I separated out so that part one was about the theory and the construct, and part two is about how to teach the children. Uh, what questions do you have about all of this information that I shared today? Mo <laughs> That's um, handy. Um, I wonder, is it possible that all gifted children or people are from origin visual spatial thinkers? I work with uh, gifted adults. Yes. And I um, sometimes there come, come uh, people into my room and they seem ultimately uh, of the, the rational uh, uh, side. And um, I, I often can help them by um, yes. discover, uh, rediscover their visual spatial uh, abilities. <laughs> yes, is, it, is that something known about that? Um, I agree. I, I have to say yes, no, and yes. <laughs> Many questions. Uh, were all of these children originally visual spatial? Yes. At some point in all of our development, we all were visual spatial. And it, it is called eidetic memory. E-I-D-I-T-I-C. Eidetic memory. And um, I probably misspelled that, didn't I? Anyway, the, um, the eidetic memory is the early knowledge base that young children have until the age of around eight. Around eight. They learn visually. They take in information visually. They store it visually. They have almost a photographic memory. 
But about nine years old, something happens. About nine years old, that left hemisphere really starts to kick in and take over. And instead of the eidetic memory, you've got verbal mediation and categorical reasoning that supplants it. Eidetic memory goes only so far, developmentally, and then all of a sudden, there's a switch. And you start thinking with your left hemisphere, except the visual spatial learners. They don't stop. They don't make the switch. When everybody else becomes more auditory sequential, they don't give up that eidetic memory and start to use categorical, verbal, analytical reasoning in its place. They keep that as their main way of knowing. But when you're gifted, something else happens. When you're gifted, you've got that left hemispheric analytical, verbal, connecting going on, the great ability to categorize. And you also have the eidetic memory and the right hemisphere, and they work more complementarily. And the higher your intelligence, the higher your measured intelligence, the more likely you are to be visual spatial. So when you do studies of the highly gifted, they lead with the visual spatial. And then they have no trouble going back and forth and back and forth because the brain is a very integrated organ and it uses everything it has. And so the fastest way to get to a solution is to take a picture of it in your mind, to see it to see it all at once. And then if you have to explain it to somebody else, then you have to go back to that left hemisphere and you have to do the translation and the integration so that the higher the intelligence, the more likely the person is to be both, but to have a, a visual spatial preference. So. I have two theories about your clients. You have both. You have both that left hemispheric facility, you write, and you have the right hemispheric facility. And you have learned to integrate them. My guess is that you attract people like yourself who are, who are highly gifted, have both. And they're more likely to come to you, the, the highly gifted. That's my guess. There's another hypothesis, and that is also, I've been playing with this in the last few days. I think it's something about being Dutch. <laughs> serious. No, I'm serious, because I have noticed that the people I've had conversations with in the past few days think differently from Americans think differently from people I've encountered in other countries. Um, I've found a lot of people like, who think like you think in Denmark, but not a whole lot of people that I've talked with in other places, especially in the United States. I have a feeling it has to do with being multilingual. There's something about being multilingual which I think somehow integrate, I don't know, but I think it integrates the hemispheres in some way that us monolinguals don't get. We don't have that. You, you are always interacting with people of different linguistic backgrounds. We're not. Those synapses aren't firing. <laughs> now, we, don't, we don't have that experience. But they do in Denmark. And I think being surrounded by different linguistic bases 
somehow is causing some integration of the right and left hemisphere that's unusual. It's just a hypothesis. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just trying to make sense of either all of you are highly gifted or there's something about being Dutch. <laughs> I don't know. How are we doing time-wise? We have time? Okay. Pardon? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear her. One question. One question? Yes. Hello. Um, you told us that at nine years old, uh, something happens with the left hemisphere. Is that because of the way we teach children, or is it also with children who doesn't have any schooling? Oh, that we switch to the left yes. hemisphere? That's a natural part That's of natural part. child development. Okay. Your right hemisphere develops first. Thank you. So the right hemisphere is um, interacting with the world for the very first eight years of life. And then developmentally, the, the left hemisphere really starts to kick in around nine. Have you noticed changes in children around nine? Sit something different about nine, around nine, yeah. I wonder what would happen if we would have an education more directed towards the visual spatial learner? I have wondered would the we, same thing. Would we all become very gifted? Maybe. If we integrate them. We're together. always hearing about how we only use a small percent of our intelligence. Maybe it's that right hemisphere that has all the gold in it that needs to be discovered and and revealed and nurtured. Maybe that's where all the rest of that brain power can come from. I'm guessing yes. I think I made a statement like that in Upside Down Brilliance. What, what would it be like if our whole school system, our whole structure of education worldwide became more visual spatial so that we have that left hemispheric analytical facility but we also have the ability to visualize, the ability to synthesize, the ability to access our intuition, our intuitive knowing, our spirituality. What if we had it all? What would, what would life look like under those circumstances? <laughs> it's a really good question. Is it? Yeah. Th thank you, but I would, uh, would like to add something. Okay. Uh, in, in, in a way that you are uh, an example of that. I missed one word, and it is uh, joy and humor. <laughs> and good. I think that's good. Uh, very good. The, 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 uh, a very important part of being in the right hemisphere. You're absolutely <laughs> right. And um, yep. I see it in every word you're saying. So <laughs> that's, I would uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And at the same time, I would like to, uh, to ask every teacher to start tomorrow with joy and humor in your classes. You're, you're completely right on. Uh, I, I would add uh, the, something. The there's, right, no, there's no wisdom without humor. The right hemisphere actually is the part of our brain that understands humor. The left hemisphere can understand puns. But the right hemisphere is what gets most of the jokes. And the joy, to, to, to feel joy, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm hearing different conflicting information about brain research that I don't understand. But the book that suggests that you're right is the book by, uh, oh, now I'm blanking. It, it's My Stroke of Insight by, who, was, who wrote that? My Stroke of Insight. Jill Bolte-Taylor. 
she says the same thing. She says, if you want to know joy, you better step into your right hemisphere, because that's where it is. Yeah. And, and that book had a profound impact on me. It's, it's a beautiful book. Uh, if you haven't read it, what I'd recommend that you do is write down her name and look her up on her TED Talk. It'll be the best 18 minutes you've spent in a long time. It's Jill, J-I-L-L, -L, Bolte, B-O-L-T-E, Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R, Jill Bolte Taylor. And you put that into YouTube, or, and you, you, her TED Talk will come up. I must have watched it 40 times, and I get something different out of it every single time. She was, she's a brain researcher who experienced a massive left hemispheric stroke and then uh, healed after a long period of time and then was able to tell what happened to her. her the, the, the spiritual awareness that came out of that loss of the left hemisphere completely. It, it, it's so inspiring. And she does talk about peace and joy and humor. And then the other person who, who uh, completely supports what you're saying is uh, Robert Ornstein. And he wrote the book, The Right Mind. And he has, throughout the book, pictures that um, if, if you, if, he talks about sharing these pictures with individuals with left hemispheric strokes and individuals with right hemispheric strokes. And the people who had right hemispheric strokes did not understand what was going on in the pictures. And they couldn't, they couldn't understand cartoons. They couldn't understand a lot of visual humor. They missed it completely because that right hemisphere was so important to humor, appreciation of humor. Yeah. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about that in the next session. Um, what time are we supposed to stop now? Uh, thank you. You've been very kind.